hello and welcome um, on behalf of Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and Surkamp Verlag. We are very happy to have you here for the presentation of, um, of the book uh, The Globalists by Qu Quinn Slobodian. Welcome. Uh, Quinn, very nice to have you here. Um, uh, you will have the discussion about your book with my uh, colleague Lauren Ballhorn. So Quinn is, as you probably all know, a historian specialized on German and international history. And since uh, 2015, you are an um, associate professor at Wellesley College. So a very warm uh, welcome. My colleague Lauren Ballhorn uh, works in our uh, um, political communication uh, department at Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. And I also want to thank um, um, all, all of you from Surkamp Verlag that we are the ones who are allowed to present this uh, very nice book. Um, uh, we liked already a, uh, a lot when we uh, looked through it. Um, so I was, <laughs> I, I was um, very excited, or I had a lot of fun when I was um, reading a, a text about your book um, from Tobias Ruprecht on Hazard the Kult. Is he here? No. So, um, and his comment on your book started um, uh, started uh, with something I, I found very I found very true. So he said, like mostly. If people hear the term neoliberalism, the knife in their pocket is snipping off because neoliberalism beca become, was becoming something like a term, you know, which is used for everything which, which is evil, especially um, the left used the word now for, for something which was the word similar to the word fascism uh, for a very long time. And I was thinking about myself very critical and I thought, well, that's true always now if you don't really can explain why we find the world very bad or why we have like a very complicated lifestyle in the urban centers of the world. We just end up and say, well, neoliberalism is the reason for it. And when I was starting to read your book, um, it, it really made me very happy because I thought like, well, now, you know, I, I get the idea where it's coming from and how I should really use the term. And I hope that we all will learn a little bit of that um, uh, today. Uh, in your presentation, and uh, everybody should have a lot of fun. They will, you will present a little bit, you will, Quinn will read a little bit, and then uh, we have time for a discussion as well. There is free food for those who, are, who came hungry and drinks, and you could also have non-free drinks at the bar um, of the Aquarium in Südblock, and always also thank you, Claude and Richard, for making that possible here. Uh, thank you, Johanna. Uh, like Johanna said, my name is Lauren Bellhor, and I work as an editor uh, at the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung here in Berlin. Uh, and tonight we'll be talking about Quinn Slobodian's book, Globalists, the End of Empire and the Birth of Neoliberalism. Um, Johanna already introduced both of us. I'd still like to say just a couple words about Quinn. So Quinn, like Johanna said, is in a professor of German International History at Wellesley College in Massachusetts and was until recently a residential fellow at the is it really called the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs? Yeah, that's a cool name. Uh, at Harvard University. And uh, he's already published quite a number of books, either as author or editor, including Foreign Front, uh, Third World Politics in 60s West Germany, which in fact discusses some of the political foundations of which the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung is now a part, uh, Comrades of Color, East Germany and the Cold War World, and the book we're here to talk about tonight, which is Globalists, the End of Empire and the Birth of Neoliberalism, uh, which is also Quinn's most recent book, appearing in early 2018 with Harvard University Press and now available in German, uh, thanks to the colleagues at Zurkamp Verlag, uh, translated by uh, Stefan Gebauer. Uh, the, his, his latest book has been, or was very widely reviewed, uh, and I would say even celebrated since its release, uh, being praised in publications across the spectrum, both in and outside of academia, including The Guardian, The New Republic, as well as the American Historical Review, Dissent, and even Foreign Affairs. Uh, Quinn also writes quite often uh, in various magazines, newspapers, etc., and also appears on quite a few podcasts. Uh, to prepare for this event, I opened up the podcast app on my phone and typed in Quinn Slobodian. There's like 30 results. So if tonight isn't enough for you, you can hear this, this man's voice for at least 20 more hours on your iPhone or whatever smartphone brand. Um, <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's, it's neoliberalism. It's the world we live in. Uh, we have the author of the book here to talk about his book with us, so I'm not going to waste that much time introducing it. 
Um, but I would say just a word or two about what makes the book unique and perhaps why it received so much attention and praise when it came out. Obviously, it's not the first uh, history of neoliberalism, like Johanna said. It's a word that we all use all the time. Uh, it's really, especially if you're in left liberal or left wing circles, it's a practically ubiquitous term to describe the uh, desolate cultural and political landscape in which we find ourselves. But what Quinn's book does is reconstruct uh, through a lens of intellectual history the people and the ideas that pioneered this concept and pioneered uh, this, this, you can almost say, series of principles or approaches to understanding in the world and the economy that uh, 30, 40, 50 years later became really the dominant paradigm uh, in whatever distorted form it might be for uh, drafting economic policy and conceiving how governments should run the societies they govern over. And unique about, uh, about Quinn's book uh, is that it does not begin with the economics department at the University of Chicago, which is often popularly perceived as uh, sort of the genesis of neoliberalism, but rather in the early 20th century in Vienna and later Geneva around the two Austrian economists, uh, Ludwig von Mises and his student Friedrich von Hayek, who first met at the International Chamber of Commerce uh, in Geneva and then later in 1927 founded what is called the Institut für Konjunkturforschung in Vienna. Benign sounding name, not so benign intentions. Uh, Quinn then goes on to weave a story of neoliberalism's intellectual development as an economic doctrine and ultimately a set of political ideas that really fundamentally shaped and continue to shape despite uh, all of the setbacks and crises of the world that um, we live in today. So before I get ahead of myself, at first I would just like to ask Quinn if you could tell us a little bit about where where you got the idea for the book, uh, the reasons for writing it, and what you hope to accomplish with it, what readers should take away uh, from, from this ultimately quite lengthy tome, which is, as always, a little bit longer in German uh, than it is in English. We'll have a back and forth for a while, and at some point we'll have plenty of time uh, for questions and contributions from the floor. Yeah, so thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, there's a lot of close friends who are here tonight, which is really amazing. The location of this place is actually almost uncanny because I've spent a good chunk of my life within like a square mile of this location. Naunenstrasse, Buchstrasse, Schöneinstrasse, Manteuffelstrasse, all places that I've lived uh, over the last 15 years or so. Um, the fact that there's a climate march happening downtown right now, or it happened earlier today, is also perfectly timed. The fact that it's 20 years to the day to the protests in Seattle, which as I talk about, in the afterward to the book, I failed to go to, and in a way was making up for, for the rest of my adult life, working up to this book. I should have just gone, it would have been a lot easier. I'd be like happily employed at a co-op outside of Portland somewhere, instead of schlepping books around Europe. But also because actually the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation has a pretty intimate connection to the recent history of neoliberalism that I was mentioning to Lauren before we started, which is that if you read, again, always read the acknowledgments. Academics always read the acknowledgments because they're looking for their own names. But if you read the acknowledgments of David Harvey's book, A Brief History of Neoliberalism, he mentions that he started working on the book after attending a conference on neoliberalism in Berlin funded by the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation that was organized by Dieter Pleva, who is now also a close friend and a collaborator at the VZB, and Bernard Valpen, who were first starting to think about neoliberalism in the way that I think about it in the book. Not as a generic term for global capitalism since the 1970s, not as a generic term for a way of thinking of oneself as a bundle of human capital, which we must always capital, uh, capitalize on and leverage, um, but as a kind of a discrete intellectual movement that has a set of people who propose certain ideas since the 1930s, who had their disagreements, their different focuses, their different um, emphases, but ultimately were able to kind of um, organize politically and intellectually to introduce some ideas into the world that have had purchase in different institutions that have landed in policy and that haven't shaped the world in the sense that, that they have sort of, they have produced the world that we live in. I think that the relationship between ideas and interests in my book is a lot less direct than that. 
but have provided like what is quite a convincing way of explaining the world we live in today. And even though there are kind of our opponents as people of the left or as progressives, by reading those neoliberals, we can kind of have a clear sense of the world that we don't want to live in because it's the one that they're prescribing. So the book came out of this experience of being socialized in the 1990s after the end of the Cold War in a period where globalization was on everybody's lips, where the idea that economic free trade was as natural as the setting of the sun or the changing of the seasons and to sort of stand in the way of it would be both futile and impossible. And at the time I was kind of, as I've written about elsewhere, kind of profiting from everything that was called globalization, but it was also somehow deeply unsettled by it. And I needed to, I felt like I needed at the time to kind of get to the core of understanding how people who believed deeply in globalization understood what they were doing. One way of defending globalization is of course the idea that overall economic growth in the world was the kind of line graph that was climbing upward over time and as we often hear the number of people who were living on less than a dollar a day was ever fewer from year to year. And that was one kind of way to defend globalization that you would read in the Wall Street Journal or The Economist. Another way of arguing for globalization was that it was a way of making some parts of the population very wealthy at the expense of other parts of the population. And both of these look like versions of what was called in the 1990s by its critics, neoliberalism. But when you go back and read the neoliberals, as I discovered, their way of justifying the inequality of the world or the interconnection of the world wasn't either of these reasons. It wasn't simply that gross aggregates were getting bigger over time, therefore everything about globalization was excusable, nor was it to say that we just need to enrich the few corporate elites and then everything else can be excused. They actually had a much more mystical understanding of the world economy than I expected, certainly, but one that I found actually weirdly compelling the more I read about it. Um, it was one that I realized forced me to rethink the assumptions about what neoliberal thought was rested on. It wasn't so much a doctrine of individualism, it was more of a doctrine of the system or attention to the totality. It wasn't really a doctrine of making the state disappear or rolling back the state. It was a doctrine of rolling out a new kind of state and re-engineering the state towards different ends. It wasn't actually a doctrine of liberating the markets. We often hear about the 1990s as a time of unfettered markets, but that really clashes with the truth of the 1990s, which is the production of ever more forms of law, ever more institutions to enclose human knowledge, to enclose um, the natural world, and to encode it in assets and trade it in new ways. So why do we talk about this as a doctrine of rolling back the state and freeing markets when it's actually about reinventing the state and enclosing and encasing ever more of the world and treating it as property. So what I discovered reading the, reading the neoliberals themselves is that Hayek is uh, quite a trippy character, if any of you want to get into that material. He sees the world economy um, not as something that can even be measured, let alone sort of penetrated and forecast and predicted. He compares it to a school of fish. He compares it to a cluster of neurons, the, the entirety of the galaxy. And because the economy is just one natural system among many, we need to sort of respect its complexity. And the only thing we can do is create institutions that can sort of encase the economy rather than penetrating to the heart of the economy and making it reveal its truths. So I realized that neoliberalism, especially at the global level, is much more of a project of law and statecraft than it is a project of economics per se. And the way that the left often puts these three things in the same bucket, neoliberalism, economics, and markets, and acts like they're all equivalent to each other is actually not only historically inaccurate, but it's also politically unhelpful and disempowering.
because you're taking away the possibility of, for example, drawing on alternative forms of economic knowledge for your own projects. You're, you're eliminating the possibility of using markets as socialists have done for the last hundred years in different ways for your own political purpose. And you're creating, in fact, this kind of hybrid um, bugbear monster out of all the things that you think are destroying the world. When you go back and read the neoliberals themselves, you bring their project down to earth. You reveal that their influence is not total and that their um, ability to shape institutions, whether it's Europe as an integrated uh, institution, whether it's the WTO, whether it's the United Nations, is always partial and always in competition with other forms of politics. So this was a way of me bringing down the kind of the big nothing of the world economy that sort of haunted my teenage years as like an angsty and probably um, clinically depressed um, 18 and 19 year old, giving it a face, giving it a biography, giving it a history in a specific place and time, and thus hopefully giving a kind of a terrain where we can engage with more effect as uh, political actors. So obviously there's a lot of material in the book um, that we could talk about, and I'm sure that people in the audience have their own specific questions, but I wanted to start out with uh, something that right in the beginning of the book that I had no idea about um, that really surprised me, namely to what extent these early neoliberal thinkers, and uh, Mises in particular, were motivated by uh, sh a mixture of revulsion and shock and horror at the election of a, well, I guess in today's terms, very radical, but in historical terms for 1919, fairly moderate social democratic administration in Vienna, Austria, and some of the initial public housing and socialization measures they were taking, and to what extent uh, the theory of neoliberalism comes as a response to a victory of the, the classical workers' movement and classical, um, yeah, classical socialist movement, uh, which, at least as far as I know, is generally not, it's not generally, neoliberalism is not seen as a response to uh, the success of, of the European socialist movement. And I, it got me to thinking um, both this, this motivation as a response to uh, a socialist movement, but also these mystical elements in, in, in their thinking that you bring up. I mean, it kind of, on a superficial level, um, but I'm an editor, not an academic, so I'm allowed to stay superficial. Uh, it reminded me of some of the elements of early German and Austrian fascism, right? Uh, horror at the rising workers' movement and a mixture of almost quasi-religious and mystical conceptions of the people and the nation, I think like groups like the, the Tool Society. Um, are there, were there overlaps or can these be seen as sort of not, not you know, maybe parallel responses to really the fundamental challenge to liberal modernity in the early 20th century or would you say that these are nevertheless two distinct, I mean obviously today they're very distinct currents, uh, but mm -hmm. In these early years, were there overlaps? Are these coming from the same sort of coming from the same place, so to speak? I mean, I think one of the distinctive things about neoliberalism, and one of the ways that, ironically enough, it's kind of an ideology that I think a lot of people can relate to in the present moment, is it's a very it, it's it's it has very low demands of human nature, actually, right? It doesn't it it doesn't um, require great leaps of of um, of uh, intersubjective kind of uh, connection for it to work. The argument that, neo that neoliberals use is that in the, in the words of a, another book written recently about, about liberalism is that we need to reach for the realm of the lesser evil. So l neoliberalism is not a kind of utopian ideology. It's the ideology that's a little bit better than the alternative. And the alternative is always collectivism in their minds. And collectivism, according to Hayek, still draws people in because it appeals to these deep evolutionary memories that we have as humans of living in small communities on the savanna as tribes people. <laughs> this is literally what he said. So that when we lived in small communities that were small enough that we could share things amongst each other and see everyone who you hunted with and gathered with and that you loved, then it made sense to have solidarity. It made sense to have compassion and kindness. Those were functional 
actually, for that moment of human evolution and human civilization. As humanity became more complex and specialized, we became less used to face-to-face -face contact, and we had to actually deaden our emotions to the reality of ever more complex forms of capitalist production. So a world in which you're consuming things that have passed through many hands, that have followed like a supply chain from the mines of Congo to Taiwan to Germany, requires a kind of dehumanization, which most people, including socialists, would see as, a, in a way, the tragedy of modern life. To neoliberals, it is the necessity of modern life, the precondition of modern life. And to interfere with that is to break the mechanism of the good society. So to care about the condition of production and the condition of, of, of the world's extended order, as Hayek calls it, would be to make the whole mechanism seize up. So when Mises defends Italian fascism in 1927, which he does, he defends it by saying, for the time being, they have done civilization a great service because they have beaten back the collectivizers, right? Because it's not that he likes Mussolini per se, it's not like that he has admiration for fascism per se, but it is the second best option to the socialists who want to take us back to the savanna and in the process kill most of humanity because in their way of thinking, capitalism is what keeps humanity alive and to interfere with capitalism is to commit mass murder, which explains some of the resonance of the Great Leap Forward Stalin's famines, Venezuela, for libertarian think tank websites worldwide. Right? I mean, these are their most frequent sort of touchstones, which is, you know, funny in a way, but also like kind of hardcore biopolitics, right? I mean, it's kind of like pretty persuasive propaganda in a way, like follow our system or you'll die. Not because we will kill you or someone else will, but because the system will cease to sustain you, right? So speaking on behalf of the system, as they do, is something that they use against the class argument of the socialists, which I think is different from the fascist argument against the socialists, right? I mean, fascists use race or nation against class. Neoliberals use, in a way, the global system against class, right? They use the universal against class. So structurally, it's kind of similar, but it has that weird... Um, tendency to diffuse itself all over the world instead of localizing on one, one nation, national space, or one racial group. But you do have a whole chapter in the book. Um, I think it's titled A World of Races in the, in the, uh, in the English uh, edition, uh, specifically about some of these thinkers' very retrograde views on race, so like mm -hmm. Rupke, uh, who wrote an entire book defending apartheid South Africa, or an, an attempt at a positive appraisal, mm -hmm. I think was the subtitle. Um, and Mises himself uh, was also, at least briefly, in the patriotic front in Austria, flirted with the Austro-fascist government, tried to develop some economic policies um, for them. So would you say that these, both these concrete relations with mm -hmm. uh, active fascist movement or government, as well as the racial ideas, are these just intellectual residue of uh, retrograde 19th century thinking? I mean, how do, is, there a, is there an intrinsic link? Yeah, I mean, I, th I would say two things about that. One, you know, you can be an authoritarian without being a fascist, right? And the way that neoliberals defend authoritarianism is not authoritarianism that is defending the sanctity of the nation or the sanctity of the people. It's authoritarianism that defends the sanctity of globally interconnected capital markets. So if you read Hayek, when he most explicitly um, supports Pinochet, he supports Pinochet in the same piece that he supports South Africa, apartheid South Africa, but not by supporting Chilean policies per se, or South African policies per se, but by criticizing the UN and the international community for interfering with 
the free flow of goods internationally. So if, you can, if the UN can decide apartheid is immoral, the Chilean form of dictatorship is immoral and put sanctions on these countries, then you've just politicized the world economy in a way that is itself the fault, right? So, so in that sense, they're speaking on behalf of the whole and authoritarianism, when they support it, they support it because they see those authoritarian leaders as guardians of economic order. And economic order always exceeds any one territorial space except for the world space. Oh, on the race thing, though, I, I, should, I should answer that. No, but it's a huge part of the, the story in a way, even though it's sometimes subtext. Um, you know, this, the trick of liberalism in the 19th century sense is, is the same in a way as the trick of neoliberalism, which is to be able to hold apparently contradictory things in your head, which is that we can have a world that is filled with radically different people at maybe even radically different stages of civilization, and yet they can all constructively um, be part of the same thing, which is a world economy. Right, it's this combination of diversity and universality that is kind of at the heart of the liberal proposal about, about order. And the globalism of the title really is a way to describe those neoliberals who agreed with that basic concept that all populations were somehow assimilable into a world economic space with no promise of equality at a distributive level or no outcome of social um, evenness at the world level. But you could all do your part and you will get your just dessert out of that, right? You will enter the world market and you will get something out of it. No promises about what it's gonna be. The peculiarity about Wilhelm Rupke, you know, praised as one of the intellectual fathers of the social market economy in Germany, kind of almost close to a household name in Switzerland, from what my Swiss friends tell me, is that he begins in this mode, basically saying the world, it needs to be the world, fascists, one of their problems is they think you can do an economy nationally, you can't, gotta be global. Um, in the course of decolonization, in the course of the end of overseas European empires, he starts to change his mind, basically. And he starts to think that Actually, these populations in Africa in particular are not potential market actors. They are not potential entrepreneurs, capitalists, or even um, productive workers inside of the world system. So they need to be not even integrated unevenly or unequally, but they need to be secluded from the world economic system. So in that sense, he sort of ceases being a globalist, I would say because he starts to see the world in terms of civilization and blocks that should be only defended from one another instead of being integrated with one another. And, and importantly, that he becomes one of the first founding members of the Mont Pelerin Society to leave. He's like the first schism in the neoliberal movement is over this question, which is his argument that certain races cannot participate in the global economy and everyone else basically saying, what are you talking about? They can, they won't get much out of it, but of course everyone can. And I would say sort of as an aside, because in a way the, the reception of the book is almost more interesting than the book itself, to me anyway, because ne proper neoliberals, Mont Pelerin Society folks have read this book and mostly been into it in the sense that they feel like it's an accurate representation of their own worldview which you know, once you read it and you realize that is a little pretty appalling, but it's true nevertheless. And the Rupka part has been like the thin edge of the wedge because half the neoliberals who have read it have been like, whoa, Jesus, I did not know that about Rupka. That's, uh, I don't know if I can identify with him anymore. No, and they literally would have like footnotes like now we must face the fact that Rupka is, has a problematic history around racism. Um, Rupka but is canceled. Is Rupka, what you're there is a partial cancellation of Rupka in certain ordo liberal circles. Um, but the good thing about studying, the, really the easy thing about studying the neoliberals, is they publish their stuff all the time. And the ordo yearbook comes out punctually once every year with like 15 articles that kind of gives you a snapshot of like 
neoliberal thinking at any given time. And the last one that came out was really interesting because one of the articles basically said, we need to move away from the reactionary worldview of someone like Rupka inside the neoliberal tradition. And then one of the next ones says, reading Rupka again, we're reminded of the cultural preconditions that are necessary for a functioning market economy. And this reminds us that not all humans are necessarily able to participate in capitalism. And there, right in miniature, you have the split that is currently happening in the neoliberal movement with some ordo liberals gravitating to the IF day and others taking a position against the IF day, at least rhetorically. So the argument about to what extent are um, people capable at a basic level of participating together in a kind of global space is like actually the, the point on which neoliberal um, arguments are being kind of hashed out right now. So almost a intellectual grappling with reality not reflecting their theorems, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, I mean, well, it's, it's, it's a, another moment of seeing how their own intellectual tradition should inform their political positions um, and people on the sort of, yeah, so people further to the right in the IFJ see the Hayekian universalism as itself a fault of Hayek, right? So the fact that he did see all humans as somehow capable of participating together is a sign of his ideological error. Um, Ludwig von Mises is a fascinating case because he is 20 years younger than, or older than Mises and, and or older than Hayek and Röpke. And so he writes in a different moment perhaps, but his writings are basically strongly opposed to the Nazi race theory, saying the Nazis are treating people like livestock, it's absurd, the skull measuring must stop kind of a thing. But then a couple sentences later he said, but we must leave the door open for a potential theory of race based on real science that may come yet. And it's something that you would never notice yourself if you were reading it. You might think like, ha ha, or something. But there are like entire strains of libertarian thought now built on those asides, right? It's like Marx's letter to, letters to Vera or whatever about Soviet Union. Like it's that equivalent for them. They're like, aha, look, we can be libertarians and scientific racists at the same time. Mises said we could. And so now we can you know, fold in all of this bad science from Charles Murray to Mankind Quarterly to God knows what else and found whole new ways of thinking about an anti-globalist neoliberalism or at least libertarianism that segments the world off into spaces and is not a united space. So I think part of the, the, the goal of the book was also not to say all neoliberals are globalists, but to say there's one way of thinking about the problem of market order that assumes the need for a world solution, but it's not the only way of thinking about market order. The extra economic conditions for the market, which is really what neoliberals care about, not the economic conditions, but the extra economic conditions, are sometimes global institutions, mm -hmm. but sometimes they think it's something else, like genetic heredity, certain traditions of the domestic family, um, certain ways of organizing money. So there's a many other options for providing the conditions for the, the functioning market. And the globalist fix, especially in the form of the constitutional fix, which I think is embodied in the WTO, NAFTA, and the Maastricht Treaty, is something that is maybe more of a historical artifact than a kind of a permanent feature of neoliberal imagination, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have one question um, that's maybe a bit easy, but uh, um, since, since it is an intellectual history, uh, you know, we both grew up in North America uh, around the same time. And so for me, at university, the, I mean, obviously Hayek was a name and Mises was a name, but the only neoliberal thinker that I ever had to engage with as a student of social sciences at a North American university was Milton Friedman. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, obviously, he is the main sort of signifying figure of neoliberal thought in uh, North America. And actually, fairly recently, I somehow f stumbled across an old interview with him on YouTube, and I was stunned at, I mean, the man comes across as an incredible simpleton. Like, his thought is quite rigid, uh, based on very idealized uh, notions of how the world works, and he clearly simply is, like, never spoken to a poor person, never taken the, the perspective of anyone who isn't an upper middle class white male into account, and I was wondering, uh, because so, I assume you've read uh, quite a wide swath of neoliberal thought at mm -hmm. this point. Um, was it impressive? I mean, are they, uh, especially these early figures, were they r rigorous, interesting thinkers, or mm -hmm. did you come, come or walk away from the project thinking, eh. um, I was impressed with them. I mean, I, like, I started with the Rupka stuff and went to the archives, and was like, okay, Rupka, father of the social market economy, let's see what's in his archive, which is his stepson's office at the University of Cologne in the economics department. And I was like, pull out the files. Oh, South Africa, interesting. Like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> He's calling post-colonial African leaders cannibals in all of these letters. This is a story. <laughs> so like, that's, that's one chapter. Let's do Hayek next. So I was like, this will be easy. Shooting fish in a barrel, just calling old neoliberals racist. Like, that's red meat. Everyone will love that. Um, so I went to Hayek's papers, and I was like, hmm, that's odd. No overt racism anywhere here. And in fact, Rupka was slagging off Hayek in his letters. He was like, Hayek seems to be believing in one man, one vote in South Africa these days. I don't know what's going on with him. This is like 1962. Um, so I realized the story would be a little bit more complicated than that. So it wasn't just gonna be this expose of like the secret, you know, vile letters of all of the neoliberal thought collective or whatever. Um, that in fact, they did, they were working with this naturalistic um, system theory informed worldview that required some more engagement and that in fact, the people who were most active with building things like the WTO at, at a kind of theoretical level. We're also very, very into cybernetics and f trying to figure out how laws could act as kind of feedback mechanisms and produce these kind of positive feedback loops. So this was actually closer to a kind of like, you know, Nicholas Luhmann kind of a story than it was to a just a bunch of like brute racists showing their true colors behind closed doors or something. Um, but that's, it relates to the question you're asking, because Hayek was a Viennese intellectual, as was Mises. And what that meant was just talking about ideas all day long and then often late into the night, and often with people who were not of your same political persuasion. So Mises is known as like this, the most dogmatic of like the paleo liberals or something. But he was hanging out with Otto Wagner. He was hanging out with, um, with, Otto, uh, with uh, Bauer. He was hanging out with socialists, positivists, scientists, all like kinds of at people. At the cafe, just yeah. drinking and talking yeah. politics. Yes, apparently. Wow. I mean, uh, you know, it's apparently true what they say about 1920s Vienna. That's um, <laughs> not just like something they sell to the tourists. Um, so they were used to this style of engagement. And it's, it, why is it relevant? Because... Hayek believed that this is how the war of ideas would be won, is basically by persuading other elites, right? And Andrew Gamble, I think, put it best. He said, you know, Hayek's idea was you persuade other elites who are as smart as yourself, and then you disenfranchise the rest of the people. And like, there's something to that, right? I mean, you then write laws that prevent democracy from doing things you don't want it to do. Friedman was very different. Um, Friedman was a communicator. Friedman was a from a, not an upper middle class family. He was Jewish. His father was, I think, a trader or a small businessman in Rahway, New Jersey. Um, he actually did speak to people of all classes. And he, the success, the very success of his, his um, documentary, Free to Choose, which is well described in a book that just came out called Mutant Neoliberalism. There's a wonderful chapter in there written by someone who's sitting here in the front row named Zuren Brandes. Um, explains very well how Friedman changed the mode of engagement. It wasn't just 
you know, talking about how about how neurons are like are like our economic exchange, the way that Hayek wanted to speak to only the smartest people in society. Friedman was talking all the way down the social class ladder, at least he thought he was. He described the free the freeing of markets and the freeing of small small businesses and initiative against the faceless um, state. So he was kind of a transitional figure. Where it gets really interesting is in the 1990s when Murray Rothbard, who is a protege of Hayek's, is brought into the Montpelier Society by Hayek in the 50s, kind of a think tank jobber, um, becomes the father of anarcho-capitalism in the United States. And he has this wonderful insight in the 1990s. And his insight is that neoliberal thought had been built on the premise that the masses were all instinctively socialist and that the goal of elites was to write laws and design states to constrain the masses from acting on their own natural impulses, which would be to seize the means of production and you know, take over the state and turn it into a communist state or a fascist state, but somehow break all the rules of the market. Roth Rothbard is sitting there in the 90s and he's like, Wait a sec, we've already um, put everyone's pensions into 401ks, so 50% of Americans have money somehow in the stock market. So when they watch the rise and the fall of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, it's not the big fat cats in the, in the, in the, in the offices watching them, it's themselves. They are themselves now personalized by the market, right? They're like, they're cathected to the market. So. He says, maybe it's the elites who still cling to socialism and not the masses. So maybe we can use the masses now against the elites. Instead of using the elites to constrain the masses, we can use the capitalist-friendly masses against the elites. And that leads to a, a series of changes in strategy, actually. So, and he says explicitly, we're moving from Hayekian trickle-down strategy to a grassroots strategy. And, he's, and he starts supporting um, and advising, in fact, political actors like Pat Buchanan, who basically tests out a lot of the rhetoric which is now common in the United States about beating up on China, beating up on third world immigrants, beating up on Islam, beating up on the dissolution of the family, beating up on perhaps Jewish conspiracies that are connected to finance. Um, Rothbard looks at this stuff and says, like, this speaks to the common person. Let's do what he called a strategy of right-wing libertarian populism. Um, so in the US, that becomes about weaponizing the population against what they saw as the tr entrenched elites of Washington who are profiting from a big state, profiting even as lobbyists from the Beltway's kind of gravy train. Um, so this idea of using the masses against the elites becomes well accepted, well theorized at the Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama, among other places. And in Europe, this comes by way of the idea of using direct democracy. So the Swiss in particular, the, the Swiss People's Party and Christoph Blocher are um, seen as kind of pioneers of using things like referenda which is totally counterintuitive if you know the history of neoliberalism because they're supposed to hate the masses, right? So now you're going to use the masses through direct democracy? Why would you do that? Well, that's because there's this switch of conceiving of the masses now. So the way that the, the, the outcome of referendum after referendum in Switzerland tends to be towards conservative values they saw as positive and the strategy used in the Leave campaign in, in the UK is the direct outcome of this too. I mean, it, you otherwise might find it strange that the IF Day, as a party founded by order liberals, is also calling for Swiss-style referenda. But it's, it's literally a strategy that's been discussed since the late 1990s and only sort of well, given and, the space there now. true of the new right across Europe, more or right. less. Right, yeah. yeah. So, this, so this otherwise perplexing hybrid of sort of direct democracy, so-called populist appeals with people who are actually interested in very mainline neoliberal ideas of fiscal responsibility, um, you know, greater competitiveness, a lot of the times, you know, cutting back um, entitlements, spending, mm -hmm. and so on, is, is an outcome of this, this early 90s kind of um, re-theorizing of what neoliberal strategy could look like. 
That's part of the story anyway, yeah. Almost like there's some sort of shared kernel of like a misanthropic worldview that allows that the fusion of ideas. Because actually what I wanted to ask you next, though you've now kind of already answered it a bit, is um, I've never really managed to understand uh, why these theories, I mean, especially people like Friedman and Hayek, why they are so popular among like North American small business owners and you know, sort of the, the lower middle class. Uh, I've never really quite understood where that moment of conversion was, but I guess you've, <laughs> you've kind of already explained that. Yeah, I mean, lower taxes are usually popular, right? I mean, and, and the moment of, of the... The whole the theory, these theoretical yeah. figures that, like, yeah. guys who otherwise are only going to be want to talk to you about baseball will then also have, like, an opinion on Friedman. That seems... Right, and that's but that's where it's also... So it's a combination of... I don't, I don't know if it's quite misanthropic because if, if your belief is that the alternative will lead to the death of humanity, Duché. then you Duché. see yourself as the kind of the last barrier against the barbarians, right? So that would be the way that a lot of them would theorize it. Um, the other way of explaining it is that there's a strong notion of the society divided between kind of makers and takers. And the, the notion is always that the welfare state has allowed for like a parasitism uh, to grow where half the population just lives off of the work and the labor of the other and that taxes is the kind of the way in which redistribution happens inside of a modern state. So the only way you can get to real justice is by removing the interface of taxation altogether, right? Because then people will really have what they have fought for. And that's of course requires forgetting a lot of the ways that public goods and social services actually operate in the modern state. But it's it's a it's a also a strong way of of course encouraging a kind of class resentment or um, yeah, anger. Um, well on that or on that point I guess I mean I think especially uh, especially in the United States, given decades of real wage stagnation and declining purchasing power for you know working and middle class people, there is a rational core for people who aren't in the top five or ten percent to pursue or want lower taxes because it's one of few ways that they can actually concretely increase their immediate, at least, material uh, uh, resources, even if it means that the structures and infrastructure around them is, is collapsing, but it's hard to sometimes see the, the forest for the trees. But um, so, you know, your book pretty impressively lays out the intellectual uh, structure behind all these ideas. I guess the coming from more, <laughs> frankly, more of a vulgar Marxist background, I mean, we always have a, we have an easy explanation, which is that the ideas are secondary, right? And what really matters is the state of the economy and the ruling classes attempts to keep, to maintain order and neoliberalism was just a convenient way to justify an onslaught on the working class beginning in the 1970s. Um, obviously that's uh, vulgarized, but um, I would be interested, yourself as a historian, to what extent, I mean, could these ideas have become as hegemonic as they, as they are now without the oil crisis? Like, could there have been a Fulker shock without the oil crisis? I mean, to what extent, does the decline of the profit rate and the stalling of the world economy, well, the end of the golden age of the post-war era, um, is that the fundamental prerequisite for new liberalism to become dominant, or do you think that this was uh, that these the, the momentum of these ideas was so strong that it could have asserted itself either way? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I've I've found, especially talking about this stuff in Europe in the last few days and other times, of course, is that one of the the Counterintuitive parts of the argument is that I'm giving a European's genealogy to neoliberalism, and neoliberalism is often, as so people have told me anyway, just often associated with the United States, mm -hmm. you know, with Anglo-American varieties of capitalism at best. But the idea is basically that America is the one who has sort of been the engine behind anything we might call neoliberalism, and I think that it depends on how you define neoliberalism. If you're defining it as a kind of institution building project, the way I am here, then the interesting thing is that there are other ways that the world economy could have been organized by the end of the 20th century, right? It was not inevitable that you would be uh, 
driven towards this legalizing model where multilateralism, as adjudicated by an appellate body in Geneva, would somehow be something that the most powerful economic force in the world would agree to. Right? It, it was actually pretty peculiar and unpredictable that that worked. I mean, there is something about the 90s moment which is, cannot be understood as just the pure expression of overwhelming economic force, right? Because America could have kept on practicing economic dominance without any of these trade treaties. What we're seeing, what we saw in the 1980s with the way they treated Japan, which is just to throw a bunch of tariffs on them, force them to draw down their production of certain things. That was American force sort of unmediated there was no particular reason for them to stop doing that. There was no reason for them to subject themselves to the oversight of this Europe-based body. So what you can see when you look at something like that, though, is that it, it was a result not just of the naked expression of economic power, but also um, it won its legitimacy in so far as it did by the buy-in by weaker powers, right? And it's something I describe at the end of the book is you had people from poorer countries in the global south who weren't particularly happy about the, the package that was being proposed for the WTO, but some kind of rule of law was certainly better than simply the rule of force that they would be exposed to from the United States otherwise. So it's, it's in the same way that someone like, you know, that some people have described French socialists as actually kind of some of the most important actors in legalizing neoliberalism and the creation of the European Union, the IMF, and the WTO. Often it's people who want some form of managed globalization rather than the kind of pure power of the United States as an alternative. And so that, I think, was misread, arguably, in the 1990s by some people as just the crystallization of American superpower. But it was actually a moment of the United States, ironically, kind of in a moment of triumph meeting many other countries halfway with all kinds of special interest lobbying to put in protection for intellectual property, da, 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 all kinds of backdoor kind of wrangling happening, of course. But it really took the entry of China into the WTO and the rise of China to break that fragile consensus, actually, right? So I think what we're, what we're seeing now is much more normal in the sense that you have America that is willing to like swing the trench in one moment and then appeal to the legal code another and not see any inconsistency between those two ways of operating. They're both just increasing American competitiveness and American market share. But the idea that there was a consensus around the legal form does, I think, now look like um, a discrete historical moment in a way that it didn't even a couple of years ago. I mean, the, the, the amazing thing about writing this book in a way was I was basically done in like January 2016 and then, or June 2016, and then my son was born and I kind of just entered like a, like a sleepless fog-like state for six or seven months and then I like merged out of it and returned to the manuscript and meanwhile Brexit and Trump had both happened. <laughs> And, and I was like, oh, Jesus. I thought I had written a history of the present because in January 2016, no one saw any of this going anywhere. It's just the multilateral legal moment as far as the eye could see. And then now I had written a history of the past. Like I had written about a chapter that was we had now at least moved on from in some way. And that really complicated the politics of the book for me because... I had written it, you know, kind of slagging off globalist forms of legal uh, organization, thinking like, everyone who agrees with me is just like good children of Seattle kind of a thing. But actually, uh, what I wrote in parts of it sounded like a lot like Steve Bannon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so what to do with that, right? And And then... In that sense, it's almost not surprising that the book had these very curious appropriations where, like, on the one hand, um, you know, Wolfgang Strake reads it and says, this verifies everything I believe about the need to return to the nation and the stranglehold of supranational order. 
And on the other hand, someone like Deirdre McCloskey, who is like a hardcore Mont Pelerinian neoliberal economic historian, reads it and says, this is a beautiful recipe book for creating a prosperous society. And let's get back to this way of constraining national sovereignty and like locking in capital rights, because look what we have as an alternative. We have Trump, we have, you know, Boris Johnson and Salvini and Orban and Modi and Erdogan and all the rest of them. So it can be read either as like a cautionary tale about what happens if you stray from globalism or as the way I intended it, which is a kind of a cautionary tale about being inattentive to the democracy problem when building globalism. So I think that the way I think about it now is not so much um, a condemnation of the possibility of supranational order, but a way of sort of, as we go forward and we need new forms of supranational order, because I think we do, and we need new forms of global governance, to be like, let's not do it like that, but let's see through their mistakes where we could think differently about problems of legitimacy, problems of even enforcement. I mean, it's kind of distasteful to talk about that, right? Because when the left talks about politics, they just want everything to be hopeful and optimistic. And I, I just read the book, A Planet to Win, about the global Green New Deal. It's a wonderfully stirring image of, you know, um, electric buses and just sort of beautiful windmills and a million new houses. But when you ask yourself, how are sort of zero emission standards going to be enforced globally? And how will, you, what will there be? Retaliatory measures taken against states that start to produce more? How, how are we gonna do this? Where's, this? where's actually like the iron glove part of this velvet, you know, caress that we get <laughs> in this image of green socialism? Then I think if you take globalism seriously as not just the horizon of the bad guys, but necessarily the horizon of us too, mm -hmm. then it gets tricky, right? And I, I hope that it's more of a guide to that conundrum than a kind of simple uh, prescription for just like stringing up the globalists and being done with them. Although that may be a necessary step on the way. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, we've, we've, I've got a million more questions I'd like to ask, but we've already been going for quite a bit. So why don't we open it up uh, to questions from the crowd. I would suggest we take a couple, two or three, uh, and then we'll give it back to Quinn and see how many we can fit in in the time we have left. So is there anyone with a... Uh, oh, yep, right. Uh, so, so my question is this. Um, if we look around and look at all the various ways in which uh, neoliberal reforms are pushed through, they, some of them seem like the nightmare of, of Hayek in some ways, right? So, mm -hmm. so I'm not sure whether the shock therapy, let's say, for example, in, in, in Russia, mm -hmm. uh, where there were no rules and no norms, mm -hmm. would have accorded with what he had in mind, whether offshore capitalism, for example, would be what he has in mind and so forth. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I look at the practice of neoliberalism, mm -hmm. how, do, how, does your, how do your actors fit into this? Uh, is this what you're describing, one intellectual strand, and there are so many more, and in fact, some of them are much more powerful? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would like to link this with, I mean, I, what I found particularly uh, compelling in your book is this link with the demise of the Habsburg Empire. Mm -hmm. um, but um, if we look at some of these events, like what I, you know, when Goldman Sachs moved into Russia, that looked, um, like an empire that was even older. I mean, it looked like a disenfranchisement, political sort of disenfranchised population that were reframed as consumers, just like in the old empires in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's maybe another way of saying, isn't neoliberalism something that had happened to the third world long before it was called that, mm -hmm. coming back to haunt the West and is now discovered as something that's actually very new? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Maybe I should. Yeah. yeah. How's that work? Um, well, let me start with the first question about the United Nations. So the United Nations actually plays a role in the book um, in the following way. The concern of the neoliberals I describe is the idea of one person, one vote democracy producing a false impression on the part of people inside of a country that to be sovereign in a country is also to own the country. So there's a mistaking of sovereignty for property. That's kind of the cardinal sin of the 20th century, 
for the neoliberals I describe. Um, the way that the empires ended produced, you know, a series of territorial spaces with populations that often identified with one language and one nation. And often they thought that because we are self-determining now, we are independent, we are autonomous, we should own the land under our feet and we should own the things under the ground too. So if you're Mossadegh in Iran in 1953, you say, why do the British own the oil in Iran? Why shouldn't the Iranians own the oil in Iran? The Labor Party has just taken over the mines from private ownership in Britain. Why can't we take over the oil fields from private ownership here in Iran? So there's, uh, and this, according to the neoliberals, is like the problem of the 20th century, is this assumption that political power equals economic ownership and sovereignty equals property. Their concern about the United Nations is they thought that it was kind of a hothouse for that ideology. So the United Nations produce a kind of scaled up democracy. You have one nation, one vote, as you have one person, one vote inside of a universal suffrage democracy. And inside the UN, almost immediately, countries, especially from Latin America and North Africa, are making those kind of arguments about sovereignty over natural resources. And in the minds of the neoliberals, they were politicizing the economic, right? And that was the precise problem. You needed to keep the world of sovereignty and states, or what they called imperium, separate from the world of property and goods, which they called dominium. Decolonization, the way it went down, and the UN itself seemed to collapse imperium and dominium. So on the face of it, they were much happier with something like the IMF, which produced a voting structure where your percentage of world trade equaled the amount of votes that you had on decisions inside the IMF. That looked much more like a preferential way of weighting power according to economic um, strength. The whole project of GATT turning into the WTO, international investment law, these were ways of producing economic governance that would constrain the political governance structure of the UN. So that, in short, from their point of view, the UN saw the world as too much in terms of states and politics and not enough in terms of the rights of capital and the rights of ownership. Very uh, telling example is that one of the people in my book, uh, Philip Courtney, tried and actually didn't, you know, he came a little bit close to, include, to having the, the right to take capital out of your country included in the UN Declaration of Human Rights. So it's something that I call in the book the, hu the human right to capital flight, which is that if you overstep you know, someone's right to take, then you are not just infringing on their legal rights, you're infringing on their human rights. It's something we're gonna see more and more and we're already seeing the idea that higher taxation is an infringement on human rights and as an attack on minorities, minorities being billionaires, right? <laughs> I'm not at all joking. Like this is this is absolutely the way they will be arguing against higher marginal tax rates. So that's a long way of saying that the UN was definitely the enemy for the people in my book throughout the 20th century. Whether it can be restored to some kind of vitality, yeah, maybe. I mean, it was never, of course, one person, one vote. The Security Council was a select group that always had veto power anyway. So. It is an object of, it's an artifact of power relations from the 20th century, but as we know, those things keep transforming. And the, one of the messages in the book is institutions don't have one fixed face. Sometimes from decade to decade, they have different mandates and different projects. So maybe the UN, but I'm not particularly hopeful because I think that we do need something that acts in a way like the WTO and international investment law that reaches into states and sets standards and makes requirements. I just think those things are gonna to have to be about climate change and not about protecting capital rights. That's the project, it's a very difficult one, but I don't know how climate globalism will be achieved simply through the one nation, one vote model of the United Nations. Um, to Sebastian's question. Yeah, I mean, it, if my answer would follow from the answer I just gave, which is that if you, if you have pronounced as a kind of absolute principle the human right of capital flight, then 
tax havenry and tax avoidance is something that you have at least tacitly approved of, right? I mean, you've, you've said that it's okay because you have declared as one of your first principles the right of capital to move. So if people want to put their money in an offshore jurisdiction, then there's no neoliberal argument against it, actually, in this principled way. Um, also, one of the misconceptions about neoliberalism, often used by the right, for example, when they criticize neoliberalism, because they do so a fair amount, is that it wants a borderless world, right? But it, neoliberals themselves, if we keep it at the level of ideology, never wanted a borderless world. They found political jurisdictions very helpful because they compete against each other. One country lowers its tax rate, the other one then has to lower its tax rate. One makes the good for cheaper, then the other one has to make it at a competitive price. I mean, the whole, the whole um, quasi-Darwinian model that Hayek uses to understand the world is based on um, discrete entities in, in a fight for survival with each other. So that kind of battle to the bottom is also perfectly contained in utero, kind of in the, in the neoliberal project. It's the reason why, for example, when Austrian workers in the 1930s were arguing for higher wages, Mises, not only as a member of the Economic Commission, said, you can't have higher wages because we need to compete with the next door neighbors, but if you go on strike, then that's actually an act of terrorism because you're destroying the capacity of the Austrian economy to be competitive. So um, the idea of, of, of competitiveness between states is also built into neoliberalism from the beginning. As far as Russia goes, I mean, you'd have to look at it closely, but much of the what you're describing in, in the post-Soviet Union was indeed a legal project, right? I mean, it wasn't an effective legal project, but it was intended as the dropping of, from 30,000 feet, new forms of ensuring property security, ensuring free, uh, security of contract, the right to, to turn things into private property that had previously not been private property. I mean, it was a, a legal project in its conception, um, one that lacked, you know, enforcement, lacked kind of, kind of a, a political will behind it that would make it effective, lacked the redistributive justice that would need to take place to make people want to support it collectively. But I think you can actually, if you, if you take the, 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 the argument I'm making, which is that neoliberalism is more about designing laws than it is about interfering with the economy or that it interferes with the economy through the law, then something like the privatization drives are actually exactly legible within that. Um, the, the larger question you ask about, about turning the Russians back into consumers in the way that's a bit like the Habsburg Empire. I mean, this is a critical part of the Hayekian proposition, right? Which is that if you have a large economic free trade area composed of many different nations, then people will only interact with each other as consumers and producers and won't think of each other as fellow citizens, and that's good. Right, and the famous example he uses, he says, you know, if you have someone in London eating a Spanish orange, all they care about is the quality of the orange and the price of the orange. They don't care about the condition of the Spanish worker because what, who are the Spanish to me? I've never been to Spain, I don't speak Spanish, I don't think of them as my people. So if you can have an economic space that's connected with self-determining political states within it, then you've kind of cracked the, the riddle of um, political economy, according to them. And they thought, and there are experts in, even in this room on, on the Habsburg Empire who can explain why they were wrong when they thought that, but they thought that this was solved in the Habsburg Empire. They believed that there you had a huge free trade zone filled with all of these minimally happy national groups, and that if you could just recreate that at a larger scale, then you would have sort of you know, transpose the Habsburg solution to the scale of the world. All right, yeah, we have someone over there. Me, Cole. Thanks, um, it was really great. I was wondering if you would elaborate a bit more on the issues involved in criticizing neoliberalism, mm -hmm. because I think that a lot of people, this 
point you made about feeling like what you'd written made you sound a bit like Steve Bannon. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it reminds me of like this general problem because I think the only word maybe more overused than neoliberalism is um, populism. Right. And you know, you want to point that, have this point where you say, well, there is a problem that there is this unaccountable elite, right. but then there is a kind of even more vitriolic force of people that kind of have that same kind of criticism and then it can get more of an issue. So I'm wondering what your kind of thoughts are on populism as a term, whether you have a definition of it, whether mm -hmm. you think it's something that we should criticize or make a mm -hmm. narrow definition of it, similar to how you've narrowed mm -hmm. the definition of neoliberalism. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, I have my easy way to do that is to, or like the kind of lazy historian's way to do it, is to think about it as like an actor's category and then be attentive to it when people are describing what they're doing as populism the same way I'm looking at the way people describe what they're doing as neoliberalism. So when, when, when Rothbard says, let's do populism, I can say, well, what does he mean when he says populism? And I think that even if you loosen that definition, the question of what your scale of political imagination is kind of the critical one, right? So this is why I think that the left has such a kind of embattled uh, relationship with neoliberalism because it is a kind of conjoined twin of the socialist imagination, or at least someone like Mises was saw it that way. He said that you know Marx was the child of his moment, the mid 19th century, when the world was indeed ever more connected than it had been before through migration, through trade, through imperialism, and he was a cosmopolitan thinker not because he just was a creative person but because he was living in an ever more cosmopolitan world. And Mises sort of respects him for the scale of his imagination. You know, he says, like, sort of takes his hat off to proper socialism because they also think about the world. And like these kind of neoliberals, their political space is the world. And then you organize down from there. And I think that a, a populist doesn't think that way, right? I think that a populist begins at a, at a lower scale the scale of the people, the scale of the nation, the scale of the class or something, and then moves upward. Uh, not usually the scale of the class, I should say. It's, it's the scale of the people or the nation. So I think that there's tactics of left-wing populism that make sense and might even be productive, but only insofar as they are also beginning with a framework of the world, thinking about how their tactics as a people fits into kind of claims that can be made at higher levels, how it can work alongside struggles happening in the, in the space of the world. I think that the, the purely local perspective that begins granular and then doesn't extend beyond one's own kind or whatever is, is at least not for me a kind of um, inspiring way of thinking about um, counter movements to neoliberalism. So in that sense, the thing I would say I would take from them is like they did have the terrain of engagement correct, right? And within that terrain, there's a, a, all the questions begin. But, um, but I don't think that one should see the question of shifting scale as being the solution or the way out of neoliberalism. The scale is right. The, the tactics within that scale are the things that need to be talked about. Um, I was in Seattle um, for the WTO in a, in a very weird juxtaposition. I went today to the uh, IFG or IGF, the Internet, uh, Internet Governance Forum. Mm -hmm. And the weird experience for me was that there wasn't a single protester there uh, about this new kind of Internet governance that's happening in kind of Silicon Valley implementing its kind of power over the markets and the world's economy. And I'm wondering just in your analysis of what you presented here, mm -hmm. what do you think about this uh, digital economy mm -hmm. in terms of the neoliberal projects? And I, I'm still th questioning whether there's really such a big break in 2016 mm -hmm. if it's not really almost a continuation of a kind of legal method of, of playing out this neoliberal project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, let me answer that one because I think I can answer it um, quite succinctly. So the, the, the last chapter of the book is a world of signals and I'm describing the way that, that Hayek begins to think of the market as, as primarily a space of communication, right? So we all have, in his way of thinking, a bit of knowledge 
tacit knowledge, maybe knowledge we don't even realize we have. And the miracle of the market is that it is able to access all of that knowledge through our competition in the marketplace, right? So there's a way that he kind of, and he begins to use the word signal, some, somewhat inspired by neurology and neuroscience already in the 1950s, and to conceive of the market as the sort of trading of packets of information, right? So goods are actually just these things that kind of, that are vehicles for information, and the, and the, the big story is about, if anything, you know, talking about what the, the payoff of neoliberalism is in their minds is the, is the kind of more effective recombination of the world's information into an ever more kind of complex form. Because he thought, like many 19th century thinkers before him, that the more complex, the better, right? So he was like Herbert Spencer in that, in that sense. So there's all kinds of ways that you can transpose Hayek's ideas onto tech capitalism very easily, right? They actually lend themselves at the metaphorical level um, almost too smoothly. But they also do so in a way that if you think about them twice, as I try to in the book, you realize that, well, the signals don't move by themselves. The signals move along, you know, wires and cables that are prepared and that are then encased and insulated from certain kinds of disruption. And so the best work on, on tech capitalism is the stuff that also looks at the infrastructure and looks at the power relations and says, where are the data centers? Where are the labor forces coming from? Where are the sources of energy coming from? So I think you can do that same twist that you do on Hayek's vision of signals and um, transpose it to critiques of tech capitalism. Or you can do what other people have done, including Evgeny Muratsov, for example, which is to say, what if you go almost all the way with Hayek and you say, it's true that we all have little bits of tacit knowledge within us and it, it would be good to access them, but what if it doesn't happen, have to happen through competitive commodities and, and competition? What if it can happen through solidarity? Why can't we actually want to share our knowledge with others, not because of a price incentive, but just because we also believe that you know, solutions require recombinations of ideas and so on. And there, the infrastructure of technology is necessary, right? So that the, the, um, the, the rise of ever more complex uh, computerization and kind of logistics, supply chain management has led to kind of revisitation of some of the debates at the very start of this book. So the so-called socialist calculation debate in the 1920s was um, socialists saying, we can plan as good as the market. And Mises and Hayek saying, no, you can't, because you can never understand the knowledge inside of everyone's heads. Only the market can know that. By the 1950s, people who had been involved in that debate were already saying, like Oscar Lange, that, man, I wish we had computers in the 1920s. We actually would have beat Mises and Hayek. By the 1990s, by, by now, you have people like Michael Rozworski and Lee Phillips writing about Walmart logistics and supply chain saying, what is a corporation but a kind of a socialist space in miniature in the sense that you don't have competition often inside firms. You often do, you have a kind of complex form of mapping that is being, or planning, that's being enabled totally through technology. So maybe we have actually, through technology, leapt over our kind of our own shadow of the impossibility of aggregating information, and we actually have the technology at our fingertips now. So those are the kind of the two, like the Paul Mason solution and the Evgeny Muratsov solution. But I think that their way of, their way of conceiving of the problem, like in this kind of sublime approach to, to um, the, the, the sort of cosmos of the economy, is, it sounds very internet-like, right? I mean, when you, read, when you read their forms of mystifying the economy in the 1950s, it sounds like the way people mystify the digital economy in the 2010s. So I think we can criticize it with the same tools. All right, we have time for a couple more questions. Are there any, any curious souls out there? All right, otherwise, I have a, I have a question. Um, uh, so, oh, that was a weird sound. Uh, <laughs> you already mentioned these terms a couple times, uh, and they, they surfaced throughout your book, and also, obviously, because they're key concepts for neoliberal thinking, the idea of imperium and dominium. Mm 
right? An imperium being the world of states, dominium being uh, the world of property, goods, or the, the economy, whatever, mm -hmm. the, that mystical space in which money is made and needs are satisfied. Mm -hmm. And you kind of portray the crux of neoliberalism, or the, the, the guiding orientation of neoliberalism is being preventing imperium from encroaching upon dominium, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it makes sense. Uh, I understand why if you had a lot of dominium, you wouldn't want the imperium getting anywhere near it. Um, but to, I mean, to cut to the chase, it seems to me like we have, you know, we're facing not only a catastrophic environmental ecological crisis, but also an economy that is still run uh, in the exact same style that led to the 2008 crisis, probably only a matter of years until the next major crash happens, or the first coastal city is utterly decimated by some kind of freak storm. Uh, and humanity has, you know, maybe a decade, maybe two decades, uh, maybe three if we're really lucky, for the Imperium to breach the Dominium, right? And for us to somehow take at least partial control over the way that goods are produced, wealth is distributed, et cetera. Um, so I guess my question for you as someone who's studied this thinking uh, really extensively but also is actively thinking about the uh, state of the world today and comments on politics regularly is what kind of mechanisms can we on the left or we as progressives look to to harness Imperium? Because as you write about fairly extensively in your book, the forms of international governance that exist today were drafted by precisely the defenders of Dominium. Mm -hmm. um, do you think we can harness them or, or change them? I mean, in Europe, you know, the answer is usually, well, we just need to like win elections in France and Germany and Italy within like six months of each other, and mm -hmm. then we're good. Mm -hmm. uh, but, mm -hmm. you know, as, as we know, yeah. that hasn't worked out yet. So where, where do you see spaces to maneuver? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would say a couple things. One is I think that one of the, the limitations of the way that the people in my book describe the way that the world economy works is that it is mostly still a vision kind of premised on trade, at least in the way that I describe it here. So the very idea that there is, you know, property that is, let's say, a patch of land or a steel mill or like a load of soybeans and a tanker off of, you know, off of Shanghai or a freighter off of Shanghai, that's actually a pretty antiquated way of thinking about the global economy, <laughs> right? I mean, and that you don't even have to talk about sort of intellectual property, but the financialization that has happened to the world economy has produced wealth and assets out of thin air at like an extraordinary pace for the last 40 years, right? And actually the vision that they have of coming to a settlement between states and their sovereignty and then this world of property and its ownership it actually doesn't make sense for thinking about a world of as much fictitious capital as we have in this world, right? So that could be seen as um, a bad thing, which is that we are, you know, caught up in these, you know, ever inflating and unaccountable bubbles of financialization, um, which tend to the same outcome every time, which is the socialization of risk and the privatization of profits, the capital gets bailed out and there are periodic crises. Or you could say that their map actually isn't appropriate to understand the world anymore, if it ever was. So the fact that liquidity is as fungible as it seems to be, the fact that central banks can do quantitative easing all day for decades and nothing happens, there's no inflation, means that we are in like another orb of the world that is not captured by thinking just about kind of raw materials in the ground and which guy in the city of London owns them, right? I mean, I think it opens up a real way of thinking about the funding of massive state-led investment projects towards energy transition, towards zero emission, bringing down a post-carbon society that we have to see is happening beyond the imagination of these mid-century at best bound thinkers, right? So I think that's the one sort of positive thing you could see is financialization is both our kind of greatest blessing and curse, but it is the novelty of the present moment. And it's not something that they confronted in the 1920s. The scale was simply not comparable. I mean, if you look at the, if you look at graphs showing that the number of financial transactions or the, the volume of cross-border financial volume traffic, <laughs> 
it's it's actually insane, right? It's more or less like this. And then 1995, really, because the WTO also liberalizes capital transactions, liberalizing capital movement in the, in the EU, it goes like this. And then it comes down a bit after 2008, but it goes back up again. So this is the novelty of the present moment. It's something that Hayek did not think really very much about, something that Friedman didn't actually think very much about. But it is the thing that we actually need to understand for both the understanding our enemies and our kind of potential allies. That being said, I, I would, on a much less optimistic note, say that your assumption that, you know, given a few more crises, Imperium will get a handle on Dominium, I don't think is oh. likely at all. I mean, if we don't, we're done. I don't, I don't know that well, it's going to happen. Well, but, but then it's like, who's, which, like, when you say we, white man, kind of a thing, right? Because, <laughs> like, I think what we're more likely to get is the kind of, Hypostasis, however you say that word, hypostasization of dominion, like the yeah. private world exactly. will consume the public world. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the line that neoliberals always drew was we don't want to get rid of the state, we just want to rethink the state. But in the last 15 years especially, there's been many more neoliberals who are willing to take that step and say, maybe we can get rid of the state. And maybe things like money don't require central banks Maybe we can return to gold-backed currencies that are somehow run through kind of private exchanges, or we can turn to cryptocurrencies that are similarly run through non-state exchanges. Privatized security forces are clearly a way that we can escape the problem of imperium, um, secession through all forms of um, the creation of zones and offshore communities are, are clearly a way of doing this too. So the modal kind of like, mainstream neoliberal guy right now, who I was just reading a lot of stuff by today, it is, has a position at the Kiel Institute for Weltwirtschaft, pretty mainstream economic think tank. Um, he's in the, the prognosis department, the forecasting department. But the talks he's giving around the country are about the coming economic collapse, which will require a shift to private money backed by gold and not mediated by the state. I mean, that is just not something you would read any of my characters here talking about, right? They, in that sense, if the neoliberals are preparing for anything now, it's, uh, it's an era after Imperium, right? It's an era of kind of pure dominium. And so I think in that sense, that's the, that's the, the, um, the horizon of politics to keep the closest eye on. Um, and the way we can sort of battle our way back, I think it, I've said as best as I can, I think we need to try to like retrofit all these forms of supranational um, surveillance and enforcement for different <laughs> outcomes and somehow solve the democratic problem of, of legitimacy that has plagued such projects until now. That's a huge ask. I mean, it's just like, I don't know, global persuasion um, of not only populations, but also elites. Um, it's not something I see that much hope for right now, but on the other hand, you know, talk, uh, marches like the one that happened today are happening all over the world, so um, one needs to have a little bit of hope, too. All right, I'll give one last chance. What, one last question? Okay, yeah. There's oh. one here, one there, oh. one there, and I'll get to Okay, so we'll, we'll do a round, yeah. because otherwise we won't have time, and then you can see how much you can answer. So, you? Someone send the microphone over? Okay, all right. Sure. Okay, uh, thank you. I'd like to ask uh, if uh, you think that Thomas Piketty's uh, proposal to tax wealth can be a solution to limit the neoliberal project, to recraft the state, society, and why not even our lives? Mm -hmm. And then here in the middle, yeah. So, uh, when I read your book, I liked it very much, but I had one strange impression. And that strange impression is, the world is full of neoliberalists. Mm -hmm. There is nothing beyond that. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, it's your topic. Mm -hmm. You decided to do that. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, isn't there an opposition which acts and reacts with neoliberalism? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. You describe different currents, varieties. I had the impression even you think that social liberals are a variety of neoliberalism. Is that true? Or uh, the main question is that relationship mm -hmm. between neoliberalism, opposition, counter movement, or however you want to call that. Sure. But yeah. I think that should play some yep. kind of role. Sure. Okay. Got it. Yeah. I, we had one last one, uh -huh. uh, apparently. Yeah? Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, thanks. Um, two, two questions. One is more methodological about the way of approaching, and the other one is more um, about the content. The first one, you, you've said elsewhere, and I, I, I totally agree with it, that the wrong use of the term neoliberalism by the left, one of the ways you can understand why it's wrong is because most of the people they accuse of being neoliberals would never admit of being neoliberals themselves, mm -hmm. and that's why it's, it's worth looking at the people who did claim that they were neoliberals and see what they were saying. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, for me, the question is, how much can we take their word for it in terms mm -hmm. of what they say? Because what I mean is this, they talk a lot about depoliticizing economic policy. Mm -hmm. that, that's a very common thing, you repeated it a few times. I, I see it in my own work as well. But the question is, of course, there's nothing apolitical about a market society. Mm -hmm. There's nothing apolitical about competition, about right. class exploitation. So mm -hmm. that is what they say, but that is not necessarily, of, mm -hmm. clearly not the case. They talk mm -hmm. about rules and laws. But of course, all these things are only used and utilized to the extent that they guarantee things that were not produced by rules or laws. Things like the price mechanism, things like exploitation, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. So there's a level at which I'm kind of methodologically curious to what extent we can take what they say. Um, sure. The second question, because the history of neoliberalism is, I would, I would agree, in, in that historical period that you look at, mm -hmm. 20s and 30s, mm -hmm. that was a time when universal suffrage came for the first time. Mm -hmm. That's when the time when democracy in, in its formal sense, yeah. was understood as a real threat because it was, it was new, right. nobody knew what it would lead. It could basically lead to masses taking over government. Right. Um, 100 years have gone by. There's still a sense in which neoliberalism is being accused in whatever form today of being anti-democratic. Mm -hmm. To what extent is that actually accurate? To what extent is democracy, in its formal sense today, a threat to capital? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'll, I'll answer those in reverse order. First of all, yeah, so the, the idea of taking them at their own word, sure. I mean, yes, laws to protect property, but all property is an outcome of original forms of um, expropriation and primitive accumulation and so on. So it's obviously I'm meeting them where they are with their own um, starting point of conceiving of the order. The depoliticization thing, they were actually in some cases quite open about being well aware that that was itself a politically proactive project. I mean, it wasn't, I think that's actually one of the, the, the worst kind of mistakes that people have when they read claims of depoliticization is that the people articulating that actually believe that that's a somehow a, a moment of state um, passivity or a kind of withdrawal from action. I mean, even they themselves wouldn't think it that way. Um, the question of formal democracy, so that is quite interesting. I mean, and of course it is the response of, of any neoliberal when you accuse them of being these things anti-democratic, which is to say, well, what do you take democracy to be? There's no such thing as unlimited democracy. Otherwise, 51% of the people could decide that the other 49% would be killed and things would proceed like that. So they also agree with this famous sort of democratic paradox articulated by Chantal Mouffe that liberal democracy is a kind of awkward couplet because democracies can decide illiberal things and liberals can sometimes require things that democratically empowered populations don't themselves um, like or want. So that, but that is even itself like a kind of a majoritarian belief in how democracy works, which is, I think, as you're suggesting, not very good description of democracy in action anno 2019. Um, so I think that, I don't know. I mean, I think you just have to look at, look at moments of mobilization. I mean, if you look at Hong Kong right now, you know, what is, you know, the demand for universal suffrage is one of the primary uh, things that they're still requesting. The feeling that the system 
in exactly the way we were talking about worked when it was provisioning them economically satisfactorily. Um, but when there was a moment of over overstepping the bounds of personal freedom with the fear of extradition, then the demand for democracy became much louder. I mean, it's easy to kind of see democracy as a defanged force, but when you see places where they actually don't have it and you realize how deeply people want it, you know, and th in those particular cases, you can see the, the explosive potential of, of democracy like in, in action. So, I don't know, it's a huge question, obviously. I think that the failure of electoral politics to push back meaningfully against democracy, neoliberalism in the last few years is not very inspiring, but there's always the next election, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm speaking to someone who wrote a book called A Happy Future is a Thing of the Past, so I don't expect you to join me in my optimism. Um, the second question was about, oh yeah, so I disagree with that reading of my book. I actually think that I set up every chapter around a conflict, around a challenge that neoliberals are facing. Either the challenge of an organized working class, the challenge of post-war social democracy, the challenge of an empowered global south making strong claims in the United Nations and carrying them out through things like the oil, the oil uh, embargo and the new international economic order. So in fact, I think my whole story is one of movement and counter movement and trying to see neoliberalism as something that did not emerge out of the heads of neoliberals alone, but something that emerged in conflict with what was seen as the worst option, right? The worst option of the collectivizers, how to, how to always contain that. So that, in that sense, I would, I would say that, I would just disagree, that I think that my book actually is about conflict and it is about alternatives. And in, even in the case of Europe, I don't say Europe is neoliberal full stop, I say, even the neoliberals disagreed. Europe was many things. People were arguing about what it should be in the 50s, in the 70s, in the 90s, and they, they still are today. So I think keeping that political contention is, is actually really essential for telling a history of, of ideas in the right way. Um, the Piketty thing. So this is, a perfect, this is a perfect thing to bring up because I was recently um, invited to come s to speak at Davos. <laughs> The, the most, to me, unlikely outcome to writing a book about my regret for not going to the anti-WTO protests. And it, it led to like a long series of exchanges because, they, because Davos, like the Financial Times, like Martin Wolf, thinks that capitalism needs a reset, quote unquote. But what is that reset, right? Recently, Martin Wolf wrote a column saying he could not support the labor government in the next election, he couldn't vote Labour because they planned on doing unforgivable things like raising the amount of state spending from 40% to 46% of GDP. And this is a man who's you know, one of the lead spokespeople for resetting capitalism because it's facing shocks. And it's, so the margin of actual imagination for capitalist reformists is actually extremely small. And whatever radical potential there is in new forms of taxation, which are obviously essential, are when filtered through, you know, the um, reception of the, the opinion creation creators, even those who claim that capitalism needs reforming, um, is immediately rejected almost like as naturally as like a body like rejects like poisonous, <laughs> you know, foreign body things entering the bloodstream. It's like extruded from the skin. Like when you actually say like, so slight raise the marginal tax rate. No, it can't happen, right? You've been talking about the need to return the culture of liberalism for three years in your newspaper. And now someone says, here's something that could purchase more good faith from a population that could move towards the very climate goals that you know are essential, that could um, create a more socially just and egalitarian society, and that 6% is enough for you to call them, you know, Trotskyists. And, and, and then I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. So the Piketty proposition, the, the Mazzucato propositions, there are ways of talking about reforming capitalism that are salonfähig, as they say in German, right? Like, they, they, you can talk about them in good company. They are, you know, entered within a kind of opinion cycle and neutered from any, of any kind of potentially um, transformative force that they might have had. And, you know, 
Piketty, I think, is is someone who is like struggling against that. I think. I think his his demands are arguably much more radical than the ones being considered like some by someone like Martin Wolf. But I think the idea that even the reformist elites will go along with any of this willingly is probably the biggest error to make, right? It's going to happen through conflict and it's, they're going to have to be forced into making these changes. They're not going to decide it's a good thing after reflecting on it for a few months. So in that sense, um, you know, we need to be sort of like modest about how much we expect from our like good globalists. Right, exactly. Considering, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's on the agenda, as they say. We'll see. I'd love to be proven wrong. All right, in the last couple minutes that we have, I just wanted to wrap up with one last uh, question for Quinn. One of the last uh, people who asked a question said that you'd clearly found your topic. Uh, and in fact, uh, you're currently working on two books, uh, one of which is titled Secessionists, the Neoliberal Schism and the uh, Schism, sorry, and the Rise of the Far Right, and the other one, The Nine Lives of Neoliberalism with the aforementioned Dieter Pleva and Philip Morawski. Uh, so yeah, clearly you found your topic and you're going to continue working on that topic, but you maybe want to just give us a taste in the last couple minutes we have of where, where your ex exploration of neoliberalism is going next. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I just sort of previewed it when I'm talking about the kind of dominium swamping imperium thing. So one of the really interesting things about the 1990s is, though this book ends with this seemingly triumphal moment where the neoliberal constitutionalist project has won, you've got the WTO, you've got the European Union, you've got NAFTA. The amazing thing is if you read the neoliberals themselves, they are not at all feeling a sense of triumph or hubris they're actually feeling like they've just committed an enormous error <laughs> and that they've actually built these Trojan horses that now socialists will come streaming out of. I'm serious. So the, and they have eh, at least some evidence of this, right? I mean, Jacques Delors, speaking about social Europe in the early 90s, makes them fear, as Thatcher put it, that they are gonna have socialism by the back Delors. Um, <laughs> The EU becomes immediately terrifying to them as a new sort of green leviathan. So all of the neoliberal Eurosceptics in the 90s are focused on one thing in particular, which is environmental regulations. Um, so almost as soon as they've won, they have a fear that they've actually, you know, being kind of in a way good dialectical thinkers, that they've just created the new terrain for their opponents to reclaim the higher ground. Um, so then they start thinking about all kinds of ways of exiting and dropping out and seceding, whether it's just leaving the European Union or uh, splintering up na national territories in the style that Rothbart dreams of. The way we think about the 90s now as a moment where the wall falls and then everyone gets more and more integrated, right, and, and gets more and more connected is actually at odds with the way that the 90s looked if you go back and pick up newspapers from the 1990s. Then the fear was all about neo-nationalism, the return of secessionism, right? The Catalans, the Flemish, the Basques. There was a real fear of the fragmentation of the political landscape, not the, the, uh, the, the sewing together of the political landscape. Murray Rothbard said that there's nothing more exhilarating than to see a nation die. And when he was watching Yugoslavia dissolve, he said, this is wonderful evidence that you actually can't do these multi-state federations of the kind that Hayek and Robbins were so excited about in the 1930s. And so actually for capitalism to survive, we may not have to scale up as we thought for 70 years, but we might need to scale out and down and drop out and start forming um, models of private ordering that don't require any sort of semblance of democracy or legitimation at all. So that's the, the sort of strain of thinking that I'm trying to reconstruct in the new thing. All right, uh, I think we'll leave it at that. It's getting quite late and we've been talking about neoliberalism for almost two hours now. Uh, but I wanna thank everybody for coming. Uh, it was a great turnout, thank you to yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank my employer, the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, for sponsoring this event, as well as Zorkamp Verlag. Uh, the book is for sale over there in the corner. Uh, be sure to pick it up, because uh, there's another 500 pages of this material to check out. And lastly, I'd like to thank our two translators, 
who have done a fantastic job in what was certainly not an easy assignment, and uh, to Aquarium for, for giving us the space. And lastly, obviously, to Quinn for taking the time. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.